Welcome back, my friends, to another video on this unsheltered YouTube channel. My name is Rogan, and today we are talking about religious trauma syndrome, specifically in regards to how to deal with the depression that tends to come along from it. And with dealing with depression in general, honestly, it doesn't matter what kind of trauma syndrome, whatever you want to call it, PTSD, whatever, if you have depression of any kind, this video is for you. From the religious aspect, it may help you with avoiding the pitfalls of falling further down into religion, um, but so, but just if, if you have no religious affiliation of, all, of any kind and you're just here for the depression advice, then just Welcome, welcome, by all means. Uh, it's it, what religious, if, if you're not familiar with the term religious trauma syndrome, that is a new, well, somewhat, somewhat new of a, of a um, uh, statement, I guess you could say, that's come to light. Like much, it is much like post traumatic stress, PTSD, you know, PTSD, RTSD. Not the same, not quite the same, but very close. That trauma syndrome, the trauma, the traumatic stress, it's very similar. Post-traumatic stress disorder, that tends to be more, well, it originally started with strictly people who had been through war and through military type horrific environments, you know, witnessing death mutilation, all, all kinds of terrible things that come with war. But, come to find out, there's all kinds of trauma that you can get, not just from war, but from other places, including religion. And so we're not really focusing on religion, but we're going to talk a little bit how, or at least how that tied in with my personal experiences. I am an ex-Christian myself. Um, you could say that I am technically now a pagan, but my, honestly, my, I'm not even going to be talking about what I believe in as far as the spiritual and supernatural go now. This is strictly about depression because you do not need, and honestly, you should not use religion to try and fix something like depression. Depression is, is, is a far, far more different subject than religion and spirituality. Religion and spirituality, those are two separate things that you must be careful of. So, today we are just talking about, well, for my case, Christianity, the specific versions I went through, and the depression that came from it. And, um, well, let me, let me give you a layout of what we're actually going to do here. I'm going to go through and share with you what depressed me, both as a Christian and, and the things that resulted from it, from being in Christianity. And I think whether you've been a Christian or not yourself in the past, or just whether you've, you know, if you've related, if you can relate in having depression in any kind of area, I'm sure some of these ways, at least a few of these ways, will be able to relate to you. And then, after I go through the different ways that I have struggled with depression in my past, I am going to share with you five, six, five. I'm gonna share with you five ways that you can combat your own depression. Ways that I use myself and that I am going to share with you. So without any further ado, let's jump right into it. Right out the gate, very, very first foundational thing that kept me under for a very long time was the this first thing that I was taught to believe. I was trained to believe 
that I was essentially a bad person. Christianity taught me this. Not, not my parents, Christianity. And my parents did have some involvement with that because of their style of beliefs. And, and the style does have a lot to do with a number of the depressions that, or a number of the things that caused my depression growing up. Um, but with this particular belief, that had nothing to do with the style itself. Because in the Bible, it says there is none good, no, not one. That literally on, only God, the person who created everything, is the only good being that exists. As far as humans go, everyone's a sinner, everyone deserves hell, and to burn and torture there for eternity because of the mistakes we made that got passed on to us from our great 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 dead guy grandfather that we never knew named Adam. All his fault that we are going to burn and torture and suffer and die forever and ever and ever. Because we're not good people, all because of him. And because we, we make mistakes and we sin against God, whether we know it or not. We're just, we're just automatically bad. We're automatically undeserving of God's love. And that, you know, when you are taught that, from a young age, it doesn't matter what word structure you use. It doesn't matter if you even say it nicely like, Oh, you're such a terrible person, but God loves you anyways. That, that's, that's not going to make you feel better about yourself, telling you that you're a terrible person that God loves you anyways. Like, that, that... You get told that your whole life that you're a bad person. You're a bad person. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't, doesn't matter how hard you try. It doesn't matter how good you try and be or how much you obey your parents, how rarely you get in trouble. You're still a bad person who doesn't deserve anything good from God. And you don't deserve to go to heaven or anything like that. And you get taught that way as a child, you tend to grow up thinking, even after I left Christianity, I still had a hard time believing that I was good enough for, for anyone. Not just, like, I didn't even, I didn't know what to think of spirituality and God when I left Christianity, but I still carried that sense of, I'm not good enough. I'm not, I'm never going to be good enough for anyone. I'm always, I'm always, you know, going to be stuck trying to be a good person. And that, that was stuck in my mentality. That was pressing my mentality down. That's why it's called depression, because you're being pressed down in your mind. What also enforced this was that I was taught to believe to not be proud of my efforts or to take praise in my achievements. My parents uh, had me learn piano growing up, and uh, I eventually got interested in singing. I was in the choir for a while, um, back when I was a teenager and stuff, and, uh, and I learned to write poetry and things of that nature. I even, you know, I won like a little church award once. Uh, I, I helped win a... Uh, I, I worked with my team at a Christian camp to win a a a play a Christian themed play competition, um, and you know and these were all things that you know most people would feel good about being able to accomplish and achieve, um, and I I had no sense of pride for any of these things because I was always taught to redirect all attention that came to me to God because, you know, I, I didn't do anything. No, no, all my talents just 
came from God. All my inspiration just came from him. There was nothing I did in it of myself. I'm practically just a puppet with his hand up my ass. So I shouldn't be grateful for anything. Sorry, not grateful. I shouldn't be... What's the word? I shouldn't be proud or take any self-confidence in what I do. That, that's, that's what I was... That's how I was taught to act. Like if my dad literally told me, if someone says, you did a great job playing that song, you should tell them, well, give the praise to God. I, I had a friend who, also a Christian, who also played the piano. And when he was complimented, he would say, oh, it's a gift. And it made sense because it's a you know gift from God, but my dad wouldn't wasn't even approving of that statement because oh it does you need you need to mention that it's God directly who's responsible you and and you know saying just saying it's a gift makes it makes it look like it's it's some like somehow you're involved and that you deserve some of the praise. It's literally how my dad explained it to me. When I was a teenager. <laughs> and yeah. And and anything bad that happened to me, I I was trained to believe that it was God's punishment. And anything that good happened to me, I, I wasn't worthy of it, and it was just God's mercy coming through. Anything that happened, anything good that happened to me, ah, oh, it's not because I deserved it. It's not because I worked my ass off and worked so hard or anything like that. No, it was just God being nice. I'm, I'm a scum bucket who doesn't deserve anything. That's what I was taught, and that really, really affected me for a long time. But what else? That you know, that wasn't it. <laughs> Oh, it gets even better. When I was a child, you know, I, I had a hard time getting along with my dad. Yeah, uh, yeah, I've been able to tell from following this channel already. Um, but there was a point where, I, you know, I tried to turn to my mom and was trying to connect with her as a child. And I, I noticed very, very early on, I remember the incident like it was yesterday. Trying, trying to connect and just talk about my interests with, with my parents, and realizing that they did not have any interest in my personal interests, and and I, I and then especially later on, when I got older because I was being homeschooled, homeschooled for twelve years. Once I met other kids and saw how they acted with their parents, I saw immediately, almost immediately, almost immediately, that most kids were in a much closer relationship with their parents than I was with mine. And so that added to my depression. On top of that, and in addition to being uh, homeschooled, well, it's becoming more of a popular thing now, I guess, with the whole pandemic and all that. But with my particular homeschooling, I was homeschooled all 12 years. And on top of that, it makes it a little extra different. Like, I mean, imagine not having a whole lot of friends in general from homeschooling. You would maybe, yeah, neighborhood kids, that would be normal. If I had lived in America during that time of, of growing up with, or in, in such an environment like that. But uh, no, I was actually raised in Russia for 10 of those 12 years that I was being homeschooled because my parents wanted to be missionaries. So, and, and honestly, the, the, the Depression didn't start while I was there in Russia. Like, while I was a kid, when I was a missionary kid and all that, before I hit my teenage years, I had no idea what kind of a situation I was in. I, For all I knew, my life was normal. 
it wasn't until I got until well until we moved back to the U.S. and I saw what normal life for normal Americans and other normal kids was like, and I saw the massive difference. The massive. Yeah. Every, mostly everyone else has more friends. Mostly everyone else knows what's going on. There's this whole thing called pop culture that exists. What the fuck? So many people know about all these random TV shows and cartoons and things that I was never exposed to. And so coming back and moving back into the U.S., I had this, I had a whole disconnection and like that I realized, that I discovered that I had with everyone else. And so that depressed me. I had a hard time making friends. I had a hard time, like I, 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 I struggled with making girlfriends. I, I had a few friends, thanks to a church here and there that had a, few young kids they weren't they weren't modern churches they were they were very old-fashioned style of churches so young people as in like young adults people who had just moved out of their parents homes and had the option to keep coming back they, they were choosing to go to younger more hip mainstream churches than the old school churches that i was raised in so there was hardly any young people in the churches that I was going to even after we moved back to the U.S. Never had, never really had more than four or maybe five friends all at one time. So I struggled with that. With the girlfriends, well, because I was homeschooled, we didn't have PT. No physical training or physical education courses. Um, and I love food. <laughs> I gained some weight. I, I became quite, quite the big boy. I was not working out at all. No muscle. It was all fat. I was, I was, about, I was about 275 pounds of pretty, pretty evenly distributed yeah um and i did not like how i looked up till recently i've still been struggling with that <laughs> believe it or not um in fact i'll tell you a little secret right now the whole reason i shaved my beard off part of okay part of it was because i've always had this double chin that i really didn't like because i've inherited both my parents kind of kind of have one each and neither of them were in the best of shape when I was growing up not not as big as what I got but you know big enough to to have that extra meat there and I just I didn't like seeing it on them I hated it if I was going to get it on me and then when I got it then when I got fat I became sensitive to it and then I didn't like it then I grew up I got a beard to cover it. I got back and, you know, obviously I lost the weight and everything because I didn't like being overweight and everything. And I grew the beard specifically to hide that double chin that I still kind of have if I scrunch up and do this. Or I turn at the right angle and you can still see it there. <laughs> but I've been trying to accept myself. I've been getting, getting better at it. Um, and that... Removing the beard was part of practicing me doing that self-acceptance. But that, that's how much I hated myself. That later on, I grew a beard just to cover my own face. And then, at the crowning peak of it all, the biggest thing that made me depressed was just being different. Because let me tell you, I don't know how many missionary kids you know. But even if you do know any, what's the chance that you know a missionary kid who spent 10 years of their childhood in a foreign country, much less spent 10 years of their childhood in a foreign country, and were also completely homeschooled? 
with no real public education. What passes the rules for being homeschooled public education? Yeah, I got that. I couldn't tell can, can you remember what you learned in high school? Okay. Uh take a little take away even more of that? I don't know how much more, but you would be taking away even more of that, and that's what you get with me. And then add a foreign country's experience on top of that to where when you're an adult, you kind of have this, these, this dual patriotism type of thing. Unless you continue to grow even further and, and then realize, you know, all of humanity is really just one big family. But when you're, when you're going through... Like, there's, there's really nothing like being torn between two different countries. It, it's so hard to explain. Like, you really have to experience it for yourself. Like, imagine, like, your first language is English. Okay. So, at three years old, when you are just starting to really learn it, your parents decide to take you and your older siblings or whatever other siblings you have. For me, it was all, it was my older siblings, the ones who were old enough or young enough to still be living at home. And they take you to a completely different country. You're three years old, three years old. You know hardly jack shit about life. And you're already switching countries for who knows how long, but it ends up being 10 years. Now, I didn't spend 100% of those 10 years over there. My parents had to come back to renew our visas and stuff. And so we would do some traveling around the U.S. But honestly, for me, it, it be, we spent so much time over in Russia to where it felt like when we came back to, the, to, to, to America, it was... That, to me, was, it, f I knew, I knew we weren't going on vacation, but that's kind of how it felt. Like, when you go traveling for vacation somewhere else to a different state or a different country, if you're lucky enough, for a few weeks or a, or a month, if you're really lucky, that's, well, I, I, I can't remember exactly how long we were stuck back, but it was for whatever the legal limit was, and it was because my parents always wanted to get back to the missionary work as soon as possible. So whatever the minimum was, whatever we could get away with, we'd get back as soon as possible. And when we were in the U.S., we traveled even more than we did when we were in Russia because there were all these churches supporting my dad, or my, our, our family, um, and so my dad would, had pictures that he would show on a big slide projector, all these different churches. We traveled around the U.S. Um, to all these different places. And so, you know, of course, being homeschooled, convenient. You just take the schooling with you. And, and so, you know, and then, you know, you're done with that. Then, you know, you go back to the foreign country where... You know, that, that does not have your first language. And you go back there and that's, you know, that's, to you, that's home. That, that place where no one else speaks the same language as you, that's home. And then when you're almost 13, you go back to your actual home country. And you get to finally discover what was going on in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. You get to start experiencing the country of whose history you've been learning about this whole time while in a foreign country. And you have to try to explain to everyone where you're from because you don't sound like the state you were born in because you didn't live there. You have to explain to everyone what a missionary is, because most, because 
surprisingly, a lot of people don't know what a missionary is. They think it has something to do with sex. Sometimes. Uh, and, and, you know, things in Russia are not the same as over here. You know, not just pop culture-wise, but literally everything. There is everything I learned over there, almost everything, is different from over here. So there's so many differences I had to make adjustments to as a child. And then all these realizations that I had to come to terms with growing up. And then I've ended up leaving Christianity. Although to be fair, I had I, I was in different I was in a different position with depression by then. Um, so maybe that that is that is a difference that is a little bit different of an angle for me. Because as you can imagine by this point, I'm used to being alone. So leaving Christianity didn't really depress me any further than I already was. In fact, it kind of alleviated a bit of my depression. But I want to talk about being being different for just a little, for just a minute, being unique. And I know this is not going to apply to everyone. I mean, may, maybe maybe you maybe maybe it does. Uh, it'd be great if it does. So hopefully, this helps everyone that sees this video. Uh, but if you you feel like there is something in your life that makes you super different. Just like, like, sure, you've got all the regular likes and dislikes like everyone else. You know, I do too. I love Star Wars. I love Lord of the Rings. I don't like broccoli for the most part. <laughs> you know, I, there's normal things about me that you and I can relate to, but you know, is there something really, really unique that happened to you that made you feel like, oh my gosh, there is literally no one else in the world who has been through what I have. Like, what the fuck? I am alone. Fuck. Yeah, like, have you ever had that? Like, even if you find out later that someone else has been through a similar or the exact same thing, you still go through that feeling. Right? And at some point you do. Um, so, I'm, I, I, I go through that feeling all the time. That, that feeling is like a monkey on my back. It never goes away. Of, of always being different. Always, always, you know, I, I, I'm always feeling like I'm trying to, well, sometimes I, I'm feeling like I'm trying to catch up. I'm, I'm learning to let go of that now. Been, been doing the stuff that I'm going to share with you that's been helping me do that. But it really weighed on me how different I was. Like how much I could not connect with other people because of this, this one combination of being homeschooled so much and being a missionary kid for so long. Just together, just like, creates a really f unique individual now, doesn't it? And where are the other people like me? I do not know. Do they even exist? Do they, do they exist on my specific spectrum? On my exact note? Probably not. It would be, it would be really something for, for me to meet someone who has the exact same time of experience that I have. It wouldn't even matter if it was a different country or the same. Like, it'd be crazy if it were the same one. It wouldn't, it probably wouldn't be the same one. But, I mean, imagine, you know, like, what are the odds of, like, running into another person who's been homeschooled for 12, all 12 years, as well as being a missionary kid for 10 Odds aren't super high, so and, and there's there's and, and there's there's a crap ton of other unique ex 
experiences out there that other people have. And I'm willing to bet that most people have something that happens to them that they feel like they just can't relate to anyone else about. And they, they feel like they're the only one where it's, it's happened to them. And there's, there's always that one thing or that one feeling, that one angle to where it's like no one could understand just how that event hit me. No one, no one can really relate how that hit me. And, and you know, and, and maybe, maybe that's true. Maybe you are literally one of the most unique people in the world. And if you are, well, I hate to burst your bubble, but you're actually not alone. You see, when you're not like everyone else, when you're not, uh, when you're not as cookie cutter like everyone else, that automatically removes you from the group. Yes, it's the group you wanted to be part of originally. We all wanted to be part of it originally. But when you are not part of that group, that doesn't mean, that does not automatically mean you are alone. You're not the, because you're not, you're not the only unique person out there. You are in an entire plethora, an entire rainbow of colors that cannot be fathomed of a group that you are in. Like, think, think of the normal world, okay? Everyone in the world that's normal, okay? That's a rainbow, a variety right there. Normal is a big-ass variety. And to be so unique that you don't fit in to any of, this, of the status quos of normal, that doesn't... Like, yeah, okay, you can't be part of the normal rainbow of colors. That kind of sucks. But guess what? You're not, you're still not by yourself. There is an entire other rainbow in a completely different dimension. That once you understand it, you're like, holy shit. Like, like, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe this is the better thing. It's like, maybe normal people see a regular rainbow and then the people who've been through weird, unique stuff, people like you and me, us looking at the normal rainbow is like a normal person looking at a rainbow on shrooms. It's just extra, whoa, extra trippy. Although I guess with the unique, or with, with the mushroom size, mushroom side of it, um, there, there is the dark trippy aspect, which of course does go right along with this, but, and that, that, you know, that makes it, that makes it all the heavier. You feel that much more unique. You feel that much more different. It really does, it, or it can add a lot more pressure. It can feel a lot more uncomfortable because there's no one else like you. And there, that is something that you do have to accept sometimes is that there are some people in this life and you might be one of them, but there's literally no one else with that specific experience like what you had. That makes you special. That makes you part of a whole different group of people. So welcome to the club. So now that we got that out of the way, let's talk about the depression itself and how we can actually take the fight to it instead of letting it bring the fight to us. First thing we're going to do is we need to change our perspective on how we look at depression, okay? First thing you need to know about depression is that it is always going to come back to attack you. There is no end in this life to the battles that you will have to deal with. There is no guaranteed amount of times or events or circumstances 
after which point you will know you will no longer have to fight depression or any other problems for that matter. So you need to view this as a war. A war on depression. But don't look at it as a war that you haven't won. Because think about it. Are you winning or are you losing? Are you, are you winning the war right now or are you losing? Because if you're, if you're watching this video, is your heart pumping? Are you alive? People's dilating? You, pulse working? You're, 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 okay, you're winning. You are winning. You are alive. You are here. You are winning. So the first thing you need to remember is if you want to win this, you need to see yourself as what you actually are. You are winning. You are winning the war. And remember what Einstein said? Time is relative. So, think about it this way. You have already won the war on depression. All you have to do is win the battles for whenever you have to deal with it again for the rest of your life. It doesn't have to be there every single day for the rest of your life. It will attack you, but you don't have to let it win. It's not going to kill you. The only thing that's going to kill you is you in this, in this particular situation dealing with depression. And this might sound a little weak, especially to some of our stronger, more male audiences. But remember, even if you had to cry yourself to sleep a few dozen times, you made it, you lived through it, you're here today. That makes you a warrior. You might think, well, cry, how does crying yourself to sleep make you a warrior? Well, I'm going to ask again, are you alive or not? Did you make it through the battle or not? You're here, you're alive and breathing, so you made it. You have survived. Believe it or not, you do not have to win every single fight with a smile on your face and with, with, with a dry eye or with, with, an, with an unscraped knee or elbow. A lot of the times, people come through victories very slimly. Very hard. They have to struggle. They really have to struggle. And it is okay. It is okay to struggle. It is okay to cry. I don't care what your dad told you or whoever. If they told you that it's it's not manly to cry or whatever, it's not it's not tough to cry. You know, there are times when it's inconvenient to cry. It's just not a good time for it. You're in the middle of something, you know, there's you're you're at work, you're you're there's there's Time, time is money sometimes, and you, you got to keep your job, you got to keep doing your shit, you got to keep your fit, you got to keep your emotions together, and you cannot cry. There are times like that, but when you have that buildup of emotion, you have to release it. That is, that is something that's very, very huge and very essential to the body. Whatever stress you take on, you have to let it go. If you don't let it go, you just hold it. And it builds up until it eventually just breaks out of you like a freaking volcano. That's how people blow up and get angry. They, or they blow up and they cry. And they just break down and they can't do anything because they're so overwhelmed with stress because they haven't been giving the right attention to their emotions or to their depression and fighting it properly.
And so crying is one of those ways that you actually de-stress. You have tear ducts for a reason, not just to be sad. You cry when you're happy too, when you're happy enough. When you laugh hard enough, there's nothing wrong or unmanly about you crying then. So there shouldn't be anything wrong about just letting it out when you've been genuinely hurt. You don't have to cry in front of the world or a microphone or a camera. But don't shame yourself for crying, okay? You are no less of a human being for crying. You might even have to cry more than, than some people. You know, the, the more stressed and hurt you are, the more you have to, you, the more stress you have to let go and get out, the more emotion you have to get out. You gotta go to a rage room, you gotta, you know, gotta scream into a pillow. Sometimes you just got to. And no matter how many times you've had to do that in the past to make it through to where you are today, you made it. You're here. You may not be a, a knuckles and, and leg type of warrior, but you, you are a warrior up here. You've been trudging through some shit up here. And that is where you are a warrior. And you need to remember that. Because that is part of who you are. But now, real quick, you know, it's easy, it's easy to make mistakes. It's easy to follow misdirection. So what are some things that you don't want to do? Because before we before we get to the stuff you do want to do, there are some things you want to be very careful of in dealing with depression that you might not want to do. So let's run through those real quick, and then we're going to get to what you do want to do. Do not rely on a substance like alcohol, marijuana, or other drugs unless recommended by a professional to help with your depression. Even then, you got to remember, humans are supposed to work through their shit. They're supposed to work towards not needing to rely on medication anymore. Some people are handicapped and need medications for the rest of their lives. That's a minority. If you're in that minority, may you one day be an exception and no longer need it. But whatever. You got to take it for the rest of your life. You take it for the rest of your life. You do what you got to do. But the human body is capable of so much more than we tend to give it credit for. And just go look up the healing effects of the placebo effect. It is crazy. It is crazy awesome what you can do with just your mind. It's it's a big part of, honestly, it's a big part of the solutions here. Um, of of what I'm going to be sharing, but a lot of times people will, instead of trying to figure out how they can fix their depression, they will go to alcohol or they will go to marijuana or other drugs to what a doctor recommends. And you know, the doctor may even do the right thing and tell them, Hey, take this. Uh, for so long, but you know, you also need to do some therapy so you don't have to keep on taking these drugs. Some people, uh, some some doctors will say that. Some doctors will want you to keep taking pills for the rest of your life because that makes them more money. Not all doctors are perfect, because all doctors are human. But even if even if the doctor is 
having your best interest at heart, there are people who just want the quick fix. Just give me the drug. I'll keep taking the drug for the rest of my life. I don't care. I won't do the work. Just give me another pill. I just want to keep getting on my life. I don't want to. I don't want to do the work. Just give me another pill. I got the money. Just give me another pill. It's all good. I don't care. I'm just living my life. Just doing my thing. Give me another pill. I don't care. That's not going to fix your depression. If you genuinely need that substance, and it is genuinely, properly, medically recommended, that's one thing. And that is a rare case. Now, specifically regarding marijuana, because follow this channel, you know I'm a pot smoker. I'm actually on a pot break right now. But the thing about that is, I mean, people say you can take marijuana for depression, and doctors recommend it for depression. And yes, you can. I'm not saying you can't, or that you shouldn't. But, as a pot smoker myself, who does not take it medicinally, and has struggled with depression in the past, you know, the battles keep coming back, so I've had some experiences with battling depression while on marijuana, okay? So I know a little bit of what I'm talking about here from my own experiences. But you need to be careful because you can do the same thing with marijuana that you can do with alcohol. If you go into it with the wrong mindsets, it can take you to an even lower mindset. And it is completely possible that you know, while you're smoking a joint, while you're starting off in a great mood, something can happen. Uh, and you know whether it's an event that occurs that triggers your thought process, or your mind just ends up wandering there on its own, you can end up going to a dark place mentally while stoned on marijuana. You can. I've done it. I've even gotten angry. I've I've done like, and I can. I I can do a a, a workout, a punching bag workout, while stoned. Without being angry aggressive, but I but. Are you understanding my point? The substance. Moves, according to your mind. So, the, the substance is only going to increase the, in, the intensity, the awareness of what you're thinking about, of where your mind is. That's why you don't drink when you're depressed. And you shouldn't. That's why, personally, I would not recommend smoking weed for depression. Not that you can't, not that it won't help. I think it can. I think it does to a degree. Especially if you are with other people who are in a good mood. And then that will help you stay in your good mood while you're stoned. It's good for a temporary thing for alleviating a bad mood that you're in. It's definitely good for that, or it can be. If, if you're a naturally anxious person, though, it really might just make you more anxious until you learn to stop being so anxious. You gotta train your own mind to do that. So, I mean, I'm not telling you don't smoke marijuana at all if you struggle with depression. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just, I'm saying do not use, do not rely, that's what I should say, do not rely on marijuana or alcohol to fix your depression. 
do not do that. The only way your depression can be fixed permanently and maintained permanently is through you. You. Your efforts. It's what you do. What you say to yourself. What you decide to do with your actions and your words and your thoughts. That's what it's ultimately going to come down to. You cannot rely on a doctor. A doctor can help you. They can give you the medication if you need it. And they can give you some of the advice that I'm going to give you. But it's ultimately up to you to take the advice and to stop taking the medication when it no longer suits you and is no longer helping you. It is your job to fix your depression once you have all the tools. Of course, your job is also gathering the tools, figuring it out from other people, and here you are. So good job. Be proud of yourself for making it this far, even if it's just come across you randomly. I'm sure you've been looking for the answers. Everyone's always looking for the answers. But here you are. And so... Oh yes, and the religion. I should say do not rely on religion as a substitute either. Because, yes, some religions... I don't even want to say that some religions help, because it's it's really not so much the religion itself, but the the kind of the 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 type, the stop, the style, the format of the religion that you are that you are given. Because there are more truthful versions of certain religions than others. Like there are truthful versions of Christianity, and then there are extremely non truthful and very misleading versions and they can all be helpful to you but obviously some are going to be way more helpful than others and so that means which means if you have a whole rainbow a variety within one religion then that and and only a certain kind only a, only a certain variety within that rainbow helps you, then that means you can't rely on the entire religion. You cannot recommend the entire religion to everyone and say, join Christianity and all your depression will be gone. It'll all be taken care of. Or join Islam. Or join Hinduism. Or join this religion. Just join this religion and all your problems will go away. And you'll no longer be depressed. You'll just be happy. There is no religion. There is no one universal, all, like, there's there's no united religion like that. All religions have all these different sects in it with all these different variations and varieties. And you got to figure out the exact right version with the exact right teachings and real world philosophies and understandings to be able to actually help you in your specific problems. Or you just not rely on religion to help you with your depression at all. And just go straight to the source. To the people that have actually been through the shit and realize the drugs and the religion aren't cutting it. So... What does cut it? We're getting to that right now. Five things. Five things to help you overcome your depression. Number one that you can do is to make a list. If you're, if you're not at home, then when you get home, or you can do this at the end of the video, um, I'm going to try to make a full list at the end of this video so you can see them all. Um, but first thing, 
the very first thing that I started doing that was recommended to me. One of the first things I did for myself, for actual writing, and like really, really working some, doing actual work, because like I was listening to motivational videos and stuff like that and things to help me but I was treating the I was treating those like the drugs too. I was treating it as like, oh, just listening to these motivational videos will help me and help me overcome my depression. No no. First thing you do make a list of things in your life that you are proud of yourself for doing. What have you done in your life that you're proud of? And it does not have to be a competition that you were part of. It does not have to be anything super serious. It could be... Maybe you, maybe, maybe you uh, made something. And even if no one else appreciated it, is, is if you were proud of it, if you really enjoyed it, put that on the list. If, you, if, like, you made something, built something, or or made a, painted a nice picture or something, or, or took a really beautiful picture with your skill or whatever, you used your skill, you did something, you put your time and effort into something, and it was beautiful, and it was great, and you were proud of it, write that down. But also, whatever else comes to your mind that you can properly be proud of. Not something that you're arrogant and haughty like, oh yeah, I kicked that person's ass and I'm so much better than them. Not like that. That's not that's not where you're going for. You're you're looking for things to be like, whoa, I actually did that. Yeah. Like think about a time when you helped someone out. That's something you can be proud of. Helping others is something you can be proud of. Because it's it's not a it's not a pride it's not a pride of it, it's not a kind of pride of, of making you better than others. It's about it, you are it's 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 the kind of pride that's literally giving you self worth. Like it's it's not about being pride proud of yourself over others. It's just 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 you yourself. You were you were better than who you were before that point. It's like oh I wasn't like that. But then I did this nice thing for a person and it made me feel good and it helped them. And oh man, that was that was great. Maybe I should do that again sometime. So like a, especially if they didn't reward you for it. All the more. Those those are those are some of the best best times of, of helping other people out. But just anything, any kind of achievement, maybe maybe you survived something real crazy. Because, and because of your skills, or, or maybe you you helped avoid a situation, you helped someone else avoid a situation, or you you were able to avoid a situation yourself because you saw something ahead of time that helped you avoid danger, or making a bigger problem of something than it already was. There's You're doing things all the time and you don't even realize it. Because you've been trained... To think these bad thoughts about yourself. So now think about these good things. Make a list of the good things you've done that you're proud of. Or even the in the small artistic little things that may not mean anything to anyone else, but you know if if they make you happy, if 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 it made you feel good to accomplish that and to achieve that. Put it on the list. It's something to be proud of. It's something worth remembering. Because that's something you did. And it's something that feels valuable to you and adds value, makes you feel valuable in your soul, in your in your inner being. It makes you feel like, yeah, yeah, I did that. Yeah. That's kind of cool. That's kind of cool that I did that. That's a little bit of confidence. So the bigger the list, the better. And you know what? 
if you don't have anything, you can make things and you can add things on there. And I, I guarantee you, over time, if you work towards things to put on there, which is always a good idea. You can always, always think of things that, you know, like what would make you proud of yourself to accomplish? Work on it. Do it. You can have a list of things you have done that make you proud and then things that you're working on. Maybe keep that list a little bit smaller. Just, just keep it easy for yourself. But that's one of the first things that I did. And whenever you're feeling down, you just pull that list out. Write it down on a piece of paper or write it on your phone and keep it in an easy spot on your phone to access. So we're like, ah, I'm kind of feeling like shit. You know what? I, I can't remember any of the, of the cool things I did. Let me let me let me take let me take my list out and, and see see what I oh oh yeah oh wow oh man oh yeah I did that oh I, I did that too holy shit I don't remember oh yeah wow okay all right I guess I'm I guess I'm not as much of a worthless piece of meat that I that I thought I was maybe, maybe I am maybe I do have some value in me. Maybe I can do something with my life if I really put myself to it. And let me tell you, it will make a difference. But like one person said, uh, if if you if you if you if you're gonna if you're gonna live by something, you want to have you want to have more than one leg to stand on. Like if you're gonna live by a truth, you want more than one reason to stand behind it. You want as many, as many pillars of support. So, let's get us to the second pillar of support. Number two. Fighting depression. This is going to sound a little crazy. And some of you might not like it. But it's true. Believe it or not, it's true. Second thing you can do to fight depression Two words. Exercise regularly. Oh, you did not like that, did you? No, you did not. I could feel it in the force. <laughs> no, but seriously. <sighs> and you can look it up. But... Working out actually is good for your mind. A healthy body makes a healthy mind. Research it. Experts have shown that exercising makes you feel better about yourself. And you know what? I agree. I'm not saying that you got to go and start lifting weights or running miles, or doing crazy amounts of sit-ups every day. <laughs> Nothing like that. Just some kind of regular routine exercise. It doesn't even have to be every day. But getting out, getting your blood moving, going outside, going for a walk, doing that like... Like if you did do that every day. Like, or at least on the nice days when it's really nice out. That was one thing that I started doing. Uh, I noticed that when I started taking walks outside, and I wasn't even I wasn't even doing it for my depression. It was actually because I was stoned. <laughs> but uh, but I I just I started spending more time outside. It wasn't part of my like I said. It wasn't the exor the actual exercise that I was doing. That I've been doing that was that is for my mind because the when you've got the when you got blood moving through your body it keeps thing you know you've got things in circulation things are moving you got your your body's functioning at at top top proficiency when you're working out because you're pushing it all the way to its maximum and it gets your mind moving it's real, like, you know, blood's just not pumping through the rest of your body. It's pumping through your brain, too. So you've got, 
Like, it literally helps you think more. And then at the end of the workout, no matter how intense it was or how easy it was, if all you did was go for a walk, when you get home and then you sit down, you're like, ah, that was really nice. And then, it, and then, but it also, doesn't it just feel so nice to like sit down and everything afterwards? Like, it's like, like, ah, like you've been through the walk, you enjoyed it, and now you're sitting down. And it feels good to relax. Like you, it's the relaxed state when it's that feeling after you've done the physical movement, the working out, and now you're done. And your body is just like, ah, recovery time. And you can just relax. Working out literally helps you relax more. In addition to improving your mood. And really, because exercise is good for you and being in shape is good for you, you don't have to have a perfect body. I certainly do not have a perfect body. But, you know, and, and you know, I, I suppose I should say it, you know, just, just for everyone, at, just for clear the air. I do think some people who are, you know, have a little bit extra weight can be attractive. A little bit. A little bit. Too much is not good. Too much is not good. There is such a thing as too much. And you do not want too much. So, that being said, within reason, exercise at your own discretion and, you know, Take care of yourself and that's that exercise really taking care of your body it really does do something for you the more I've taken care of my body the longer I've done it the more I've noticed my general attitude is better I get through my depressive states a lot quicker like the battle the battles are over much faster I'm able to I'm, I don't even need to sleep as much I sleep like an hour or two less than I used to as an adult than I, well, as an adult now, than I used to back when I was a younger adult. Like, I could, I could sleep between eight to ten hours before now. I have to drink a lot of beer to sleep that long. I, I can't go more than six or seven hours before I have to be back up, because I, I got too much too much energy. I don't I don't want to stay in bed. I don't feel like it. I want to get up and and do and move and go. And it's nice. It's nice having that extra time. So, literally, exercise regularly. Trust me, it'll it'll do you a lot of good. It will, and, and pick exercises that you enjoy. Those are the only ones I do. They're still not all the ones that I, like, I want to do more. I honestly want to do more. And you, you may get to that point eventually yourself, too. Just start with one exercise that you do every week, a few times a week. Start with that, a few times a week. And keep it regular. Keep it the same. Don't change for the weather or anything. Unless you're like, really sick or an emergency happens but otherwise don't change it and you will notice a difference I promise it it will make a difference in, in your life but it will be making differences in more than just your depression so you may not notice it in just your depression areas you may notice it in other areas, but you may not notice it as much here. So, of course, we want to add more. We always want to add a little more to help. So, what's the next step that we can do? Step number three. Affirmations. I don't know if you've 
heard of what these affirmations are, but they're basically just phrases that you say to yourself to boost your self-confidence. You can listen to these on YouTube. That's that's one way of doing it. Some people recommend like listening to like self-affirmation videos while asleep to help reprogram their subconscious. I haven't done that. Um, I'm not. I haven't tried it. I'm not 100% keen on the idea of listening to a video I've, I've never had. Well, I would have to do some, I would have to listen to the video ahead of time before I want to fall asleep to it. It's just me personally, because I would have to get, I'd have to get like a YouTube video or some, something. Something that I wouldn't have to worry about ads playing in the middle of sleep because I don't want to be like, I don't want to have an ad for McDonald's pop up in my subconscious, you know, <laughs> or an ad for the next iPhone or some random shit like that. So, as opposed to listening to meditations, you can you can affirmations. Sorry. You can listen to affirmations and med meditation. I also recommend meditation for sure. But affirmations, specifically affirmations, you, you want to pick ones that are specifically the opposite of what your depressive thoughts are telling you. So if your depressive thoughts are telling you that you are not enough, the kind of affirmations that you want to tell yourself are like, I am enough. I am a good person. I love helping people. I love helping. I love people. I love smiling. You know, whatever it is you're struggling with, you can make up your own affirmations, but you can also listen to affirmations on YouTube. Um, so you can meditate to them. Um, that I have done. Meditate to them because then you can monitor a lot better, you know, what they're saying and when the ads come on and all that crap. But you can get inspiration from affirmation videos on YouTube. And in fact, I did this myself. I actually wrote, I listened to a few videos between YouTube and Spotify. And then I actually decided to write my own affirmations down. Some from what I heard in the videos and audio clips that I listened to, but some of them were like, they were inspired by those clips and they, and they like, they helped me to look at myself and realize what I was struggling with. Like, like one of the affirmations that, that I use now is is literally I am not ashamed of being homeschooled for as long as I was because that's that was one of the things I struggled with that like <laughs> being homeschooled and a missionary I, I I say it for 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 being sometimes I just wrap it up and say I'm I'm not ashamed of my experiences that I've had or um, one of my affirmations is my experiences are a blessing or I release myself from the shame that I used to feel regarding my past experiences, things like that um, or more directly. But these are things that help and this is something that you want to do every day doing these affirmations with yourself you don't have to do a ritualistic environment you don't have to like sit cross-legged in a chair and, and you know meditate like oh I am awesome you don't have to do that <laughs> okay um, but just every day you look in the mirror. And this is a thing too, believe it or not. This was something that was, uh, uh, I don't want to say reinforced, re reminded, reminded uh, to me to do. 
was to actually say some of these affirmations to myself while looking at myself in the mirror, specifically in my eyes, in the mirror. And I was told it would really help. I wasn't told why, per se, or how, how it would. But, well, yes, how, because it's, you're, you, it is part of reprogramming your subconscious to look at yourself and to say these things, but why? Why does looking in the mirror and talking to yourself, saying these things to yourself matter. And I was doing a little bit of thinking about it, and I think I actually figured out an answer. And, you know, feel free to leave a, a comment below what, what you think maybe the reason is, or the real one, if you know it. But my educated guess, from sitting and, and pondering it for, for a bit, was that I think the reason why saying these positive affirmations to yourself in the mirror helps is because for a lot of people the foundations of depression itself start as a child and that's how it was for me right so when i felt like my parents weren't really listening to me and my interests that's where that's probably like the first time one of the first times I felt depressed and disconnected. I didn't know what to call it at the time, but I just, I just, I just felt it as a child, really strong, so strong, so that I can, like I said, I can remember it like it was yesterday. Pretty crazy, huh? That you can remember the first time that you felt so rejected and alone like that. But that, that's that's how it goes, and so for a lot of us. That first time for us was when we were a child. And as a child, you know, who is it that is, who is it that is making those faces? What, whose faces are those that are saying those negative things to us that are making us feel depressed as a child? Or I should say, what were those faces? Whose your parents, or your guardian, or your brother, your sister, your bully, whoever it was that made you, or your preacher, whoever made you depressed as a child, whoever it was, it could have been another child, but most of the time, the ones who really, really reinforce the depression, when it's not other kids, it's adults. It's an adult face telling you, you're not good enough. You need to do better. You suck. Why are you so stupid? Why can't you be more like so-and-so? And it's, it's an, and you know, and, and, and other kids even if we respect them as our peers, we're still not respecting them as much as we would an adult. From, from a child's standpoint, remember. So, and as, as an adult, who are you interacting with the most in the world? Other adults. So, if it was an adult who told you all these negative things as a child to make you feel the way you do. Who's it got to be to tell you the opposite, to fix that? It can't be the people who told you those negative things because why? They have their own perspective that they don't understand or that, that you don't understand. They have their own perspective that they, they, they don't understand your perspective and they don't understand the world enough to have, to have been able to make the right choices to say the things to you that they should have said. They said the wrong things. And there's, there's reasons why. They have their own traumas, their own struggles that they were trying to work through. But you, as a child, 
You don't know that. All you know is that there's this adult that you should generally be able to look up to and trust for advice and all they're doing is telling you that you're a piece of shit. And as a child, that really, really hurts. And you can't go back in time and tell that per. Most of the time, you cannot go back and tell that person to apologize for what they did. There's nothing you can do about that. There's no changing that. The, there's no changing that that shit happened. You're lucky if you can resolve that shit with them as an adult. You're very fortunate, but this is this is about you we're talking about. You and... Whether they're alive, whether whether they're around or alive for you to be able to deal with or not is a whole nother matter. And I've talked about a little bit about dealing with uh, people like that in previous videos. But you gotta you gotta say those things to yourself. You gotta you gotta look at what those bullies said to you. You gotta turn it around. Look at yourself in the mirror and say the exact opposite. You gotta look at yourself and say, you know what, I am worthy. Or you know what? You start off that way. Sometimes I start off that way. Doing I am, I am worthy, I am enough, I am loved, I am I'm I am I am smart, I am capable. But then you can switch it. Switch it around to where you're talking. Think, think of yourself as talking to your inner child. Like, yeah, you, you've got the adult out. You are the adult now, but the inner child is still hurt. So when you look into the mirror, speak to that. That is in here. Look into your eyes, into your soul, into where you are hurt. Instead of saying I, Say, you are. You are good enough. You are worthy. You are smart. You are capable. Say those things that you as a child needed to hear and say it to yourself as if you're the adult that you as a child needed to be. It may seem a little silly out the gate, talking to yourself in a mirror. But I, I made myself do it. <laughs> I say I made myself do it because I didn't want to do it at first either. I thought it sounded silly too. And it may take some it may take a few times for you to wear off feeling a little silly doing it, but at the same time, trust me, you do it the first time, you mean it, when you're talking to yourself, your inner child, it's going to make a real big difference. You might cry, and that's okay. You keep doing that. You keep talking to yourself. Just every day. Throughout the day, just give yourself those positive affirmations. Do it in the mirror. You don't have to do it when other people are around. You can just do it at home before you go anywhere. Or, you know, if if you have a spouse, kids or something, share, share, share the thing with them what you're doing because it could help them with whatever they're doing. And... I mentioned meditation that is that is a way that does help uh, that helps with calming your mind helping you focus uh, it does, I wouldn't say it combats depression directly but I would say it helps in prepping your mind for helping you calm down so just sitting and just quietly thinking meditating with your eyes closed while awake 
I can make a video about that if you guys want to watch, but there's if, if you guys want to hear my <laughs> explanation and all that of meditation and, and maybe what I do. But there's there's tons of videos out there that you can watch that will help you out. Um, it should be a lot easier <laughs> on me if you would just go watch those instead. But I, I would I would be happy to do some myself. I've actually thought about doing some affirmation videos on here just as an idea, maybe like religious trauma themed meditative type affirmations. Um, it's just something that crossed my mind. But if you guys, if you guys would like something like that, let me know in the comments. Um, and maybe I'll think about putting something together. Who knows? Um, but one other thing that can help is kind of a meditative self-affirmation sort of thing. Um, oh, I should have mentioned listening to um, motivational speeches. That can help you a lot too with, uh, with depression. Um, I think I did mention that before, but as kind of a, yeah, I did, but like, I was using that as like a, like medicine, marijuana, temporary substance type thing. You can always go back to it, do it again. It's always great. Always, always, always good to do. Um, but, um, where I was going, meditation, right? The meditation, the affirmations, the, one of the biggest things for me that has helped me personally is music. A lot of people listen to sad songs and depressive songs. And yes, some of those can help you with like relating in, in as far as emotion goes. I've actually, I've actually heard some songs that I related to, even though the words didn't like, I knew the person was talking about like, like being backstabbed by a lover or a friend or something but like when I would listen to these songs I felt like oh this is the experience I had with God and my religion <laughs> and it, it made it help it helped me feel like I could connect and relate even though it was with the song and not necessarily with the singer but it was fine I felt like I felt like I was you know maybe not like I was heard but like I Felt like there was something that was explaining exactly how I was feeling, and it felt good to hear that, especially in a good sounding song. Um, but for for fighting depression, you don't want to listen to sad songs all the time. Here and there is fine. It's 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 good to be reminded of those things, to be reminded of. Of what happened to you sometimes it's 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 good to remember the pain because you don't want to relive the pain right you you as in you don't want to relive it in other situations so you relive the past just a little bit so you can remember don't do the shit that got us into this so good to listen to songs like that occasionally but for really fighting depression, you want the songs that make you feel good about yourself. And so I'm just going to give you five songs right here, and I'm going to put them in the link in the description below. So you can so you can go check them out for yourself. I guarantee you will like most, if not all of these songs. And if you do not like all of these songs you will most definitely like all the lyrics to all the songs you will find it all very motivational trust me so just right off the gate i'll just give you a few songs warrior by atriu don't worry it'll all be written out in the comment and the and, the, and, and there will be links and the names and everything Below, Warrior by Atreyu, Unstoppable by Ad Infinitum, Curse of the Fold by Sean James, I Can, I Will by Rage of Light, 
the original by O oh, the Larceny. And the last one, which I forgot to put the band name on, or maybe it wasn't on the video because sometimes that happens on YouTube. But the last one, Keeping Me Alive. Go check those out at, at, at the end of this video. I, I promise you will, you will enjoy every single one of these for the lyrics, if not for the music as well. I personally, I freaking love the music. These songs kick ass. Thing number four you can do to help you find depression. And this might be a little bit trickier for some than for others. I know it's one of my challenges, but it is connecting with people. Say, but we've got the internet. How is that difficult? All right, you got me there. <laughs> Honestly, there is no replacement for in-person contact, though. Yeah, it's great, and you should you should try and find people online if you can't find them in in person that you can relate to. If you're an ex-Christian like me. The internet might be the only way you can find someone else that, that you relate to. But I almost guarantee that there are other ex-Christians somewhere near or around you. Like religion has, in general, has hurt so many people that you could find people who feel very similar to you in, in many other religions. I've met people who felt similarly to me, you know, who were Mormons. Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, there are people in Muslim families who have been through even worse shit than I have. Like, if I thought my life was crazy, you should hear about the Amish and how hard of a time they have when their young people leave their societies and try and transition into normal American society. They probably have an even harder time than I do. I mean, heck, a lot of them go back to being Amish because they, because they have such a hard time fitting in with with normal societies. And like, so I mean, I feel that. I feel that they and they they've got it that much worse. And the, but the, they but why do they go back? Why do they go back to the Amish? Why do why do people go back to their old religions sometimes? because they didn't find anyone to connect with. They felt more connected with the group they left, even though it was bad for them, even though it was abusive to them, even though they were miserable there, they had more connection there than they did in out in the real world. And unfortunately, it's, it's probably because they didn't know how to connect with other people. They weren't some people do stay. Some people don't go back to their old religions. The Amish, the Amish have a high count of people going back. I think that's partially because of how, how different the Amish lifestyle is from American society. And so the, the poor kids that leave finally get to taste freedom. They have no idea what they're doing in real society, they get into drugs, they get into all kinds of crap. You know, they probably have alcohol and marijuana while depressed, struggling to figure out how to make a living. I, I, I can't even fathom. Like, I got off easier. And I am a wild, crazy case. They got it that much worse. It really shows how important it is to connect with other people. So, how do you do that? If you know, if you have internet, okay, and you you talk to, maybe you're able to talk with other people from who used to be in your religion, and you've got that. But look, but what if you don't have any anyone in person to go hang out with and do anything with. Well, 
learn to open up to people at work, for one thing. If you've got a job where there are other coworkers there, uh, for one thing, you're probably not gonna wanna be in a job if there are other, if there are a lot of other religious people, you may need to move, or if, if that's the case, because you might be living in a Bible Belt if, if you keep having that issue. Um, but there's usually there's usually someone you can find. You can always you can almost always make friends at work. Almost always. If you can't make a single friend at work, maybe you really do just need a different work environment. That does happen. Because honestly, there are so many good and friendly people out there who will absolutely love to be your friend if given the chance, if, you, if you're just willing to open up a little bit and, and talk to them. And who, who knows what kind of friends you can make out there. But that is, and okay, so let's say you don't have that. Let's say you have a job where you don't even have to go affiliate with a whole bunch of people on a regular basis or you know you don't have co-workers that you generally hang out with at work because sometimes work environments work out like that there is one other thing you can do and this goes a little bit against some of my previous advice but you should go out and just hang out at a bar. Don't go to don't don't go to drink your problems away. Keep it casual. You know. Just just go out to even if you're by it's okay if you are by yourself. Just go out, find, find a bar that seems like a relatively good, safe place. You can do the internet searches if you need to. I can't give you every single answer out there of, of, because there's everyone's going to have every kind of different situation out there. But do your research ahead of time so that if you can to you know try and you know make sure it's a relatively you know safe if especially if you're a woman be safe you know um make sure you have a ride home or money for a taxi if you get a little too intoxicated for that uh, you don't want to be driving drunk you don't want to get in trouble for that shit um but you can actually go out and make friends at bars. You really can. I've done it. You may have to go back to the same place repeatedly and just just hang out. Just be cool. Be be chill. Yourself. I know you don't completely understand what that you you may not completely understand what that means to be yourself in such an environment like that, especially if you're coming from a religious environment like mine where alcohol in general was frowned upon. So going to a bar. <laughs> what are you doing hanging out with sinners and harlots? You a heathen? Damn right I am. But that's... Like I said, you know, be careful. Watch your drinks. Take care. Take care of yourself. But honestly, the vast majority of people out there are good people. Everyone's going through their own shit. Everyone battles with depression to a certain degree, some more than others. But most people are genuinely well-intending people. They're not out to get you. A lot of people would love to be your friends. If they knew you, if they knew how cool you were, if they knew all the shit that you were into, 
like at, as in you know good stuff you know like what you're a fan of what you like you know what your talents are what the stories you have to share you probably got some cool stories everyone knows everyone knows a cool story or two with some funny jokes not always on the moment but you know in conversation it always ends up coming out you've got that in you you are you are totally capable of going out and making yourself some friends that is something that I have had to learn to do on my own. I put it off for a long time because I was, because, well, I am an introvert and I was satisfied. I still am, I prefer having a small handful of friends, but I've, I've learned I need to open myself up more and, you know, be able to make more than just a handful of friends. Part of working on my social skills that I, just for my case, didn't get to work on a whole lot growing up. So that's something that I have to continually practice. So me, yeah, I go out to a bar every now and then. I've, I've picked the same one to go back to here and there. And I've done a lot of moving as well. So... I've had a hard, I've had a difficult time maintaining relationships with people. That is my personal situation, though. And I have started, I have started making friends at the places that I go to regularly, though. And I don't just go to bars. I go to other places that I'm, you know, people that I'm, that when and events that I'm interested in and stuff like that. I go to like a meditation group every now and then, um, and. It just where there are, there are other people there. You know, I don't always go and talk to people. Sometimes I talk to the people I know. Sometimes I don't talk to anyone. I'm I'm just that kind of an introvert, and I'm I'm learning to open myself up that much more because I've been that closed off for so long. Getting out there and connecting. It takes time, it takes work, it takes effort, but it is worth it. And not connecting with people is what is going to increase your depression for sure. It is It is going, or at the very least, it's going to make it a lot harder. If you're not out there connecting with people on a regular basis, at least with the same friends on a re some kind of regular basis, you know, once a week, once a month, Something, something regular. If you don't have something regular, it's going to get to you. Like, you need you need someone regular to talk to. On some kind of regular basis. But you can do it. You can do it. You've, you've done so much already. And you, you don't even know it. You don't, you don't know how much you've done. Or how much you're going to do. And that actually brings me to my last point. The very last thing that you can do. In fact, it kind of comes full circle to the first one. Because you remember the very first thing I said was to make a list of things you've already done that you're proud of. That you've been through, that you survived, or that you've accomplished. Well, this last one. It's not a list that you got to make. You just do it. You sit down, you think about it, you do it. What are you doing? Well, what you did on the list. One of the biggest ways to help fight your depression is by helping others. Literally. It boosts your self-confidence to help others. When you go out of your way to help someone, and they really need your help, and you offer it to them, you give it to them, and there's nothing they can do in return, those, those are the best ones. 
because you didn't have to help that person out. But how good does it feel to have helped, excuse me, how good does it feel to help someone out after you've done it? Even if it's something as minor as holding the door open for someone and they say thank you. Doesn't it feel nice to have someone say, oh, thank you, when they genuinely were not expecting it? They weren't expecting you to hold the door for them, or they weren't expecting you to, you know, do whatever it is you did. It doesn't have to. It, it doesn't have to be a one-time small thing. In fact, the more more things you do, the more it's gonna help you feel better. The more you help others, the more it makes you feel good about yourself. And then you can actually start adding those things that you've done to that list at the very beginning of the things you've done that you're proud of yourself for. But if you really want, I mean, you can you can do the small things. Always, always be looking for stuff to do, to do for other people. I'm not, or I, I haven't been as good at that in my past because of my disconnection with people. But I'm learning, I'm learning to do that a little bit more here and there. Uh, but the biggest way for me, or part of it for, for me anyways, it may be different for you. Like you, you may just want to stick with the smaller things. Or you may have something bigger that is eating away at you that you want to do. That, that you think would be a real help to the world. And... I want to I want to specify this last thing that I've been talking about. Let me put it down this way. Do things or do something that not only makes you feel good but also helps someone else. Because those are the two big factors that matter. Helping someone else, yes, but it makes you feel good too. And again, not the kind of feel good where you're better than others. Not even the kind of good where you're getting something back. kind of feeling good to where you wanted to do it, you saw the need, you wanted to do it, it made you feel good, you didn't want anything back, you didn't get anything back. Doing the help itself, being the help yourself was the reward. Those are the things you want to look for doing. Those are the things that will make you feel the absolute best and are the things that you are going to be the most proud of, that you can put on that list of things. You can say, yes, this is what adds value to me. These things that I've done, this is something, this is something I can really hold my head up about. All those other negative things people say may have been true in the past. I may still struggle with some of them. But here is something that I work on, that I am doing, and that makes me feel good, and that helps other people, and makes me feel good about myself. When you have something like that, you've got, you've got a really, really good defense against depression. It can be the only thing you have and you still have a good defense. For a while, that was all I had. All I could think about was what I wanted to do for other people because of how much my life sucked and I didn't want other people to go through the same shit I did. That kept me afloat for a long time. 
I still had to deal with depression coming back and fighting. I had to fight depression because of the way I was looking at it. I was looking at my life still being sucky, being terrible because of what I'd been through. And that made me continue to suffer in the present. But you know, even if you're really good with a sword and you go into a battle where everyone is using swords and shields and all you've got is a sword, you're not going to do so well because you've only got the one item. Even if you're good with it, that, that's, that's, that's all you got. I mean, it's like going, going in with only one, one piece of equipment for the military. It's like, are, are you even wearing your armor? You're just taking your sword. You're going to leave your shield too. What about your helmet? What about your chest plate? What about, what about your, what about your greaves? Your, your, your knee braces and shit. What about all that armor? What about your chain mail? The more pieces you have to defend yourself with, the easier of a time you're going to have dealing with depressive thoughts whenever they show up. I will I will share with you this this much with my with my time which I I shared it in some of my story uh back when I first started this channel, but the, the crux for me, uh, or like the biggest or the, the darkest points in my depression was while I was still a Christian. Uh, cause I had, I did some things that I was 100% sure that God had wanted me to do. And I failed at them. Completely. To the degree where I was, I was so hard on myself that I, I, you know, I, I, I believed in, you know, you know, uh, Jesus said, "In my Father's house are many mansions." You know, where you know God makes a, a mansion for everyone in heaven. You know, and where the streets are paved with gold and everything. And I was, I was so depressed from feeling how much I had let God down with my personal failures and everything that I, f I felt so unworthy of being alive that I thought I would serve God better as a homeless person on the streets of heaven than continuing to try and live for him down here on earth. Like I, I literally thought I was disgracing him and his name so much that I did not deserve to keep on living here. And I still have the knife that I considered taking my life with. The one that I chose, that, that, that I would have chosen if I had done it. And how I, how I got out of that dark place was only thanks to a, a fellow Christian friend at the time who, funny enough, did not use anything in Christianity to get me out, but actually his, his own his own level of depression and, and need for me and his life because we were, we were both very, very close at the time. And I, I felt like I had to keep on living just to make sure he kept on living. And that was my temporary, that was my temporary get through at the time. When I left Christianity, because I didn't know, because I, well, okay, I, 
because I no longer thought that I knew what the afterlife was. Like I actually was actually admitting I don't I didn't know what comes in the afterlife. I was actually even though even though I even though I officially did not know and could officially admit that I did not know what came in the afterlife, it did not make me more depressed. It did not make me want to die or quit life more. In fact, it made me like it didn't it didn't make me afraid to die either. If that makes any sense, like I wasn't even thinking about that. Honestly, being a Christian made me very unafraid of death. That was part of, I don't want to say training, but part of the mindset that we were like, I was kind of raised to, to not be afraid to be a martyr for Christ. Makes you wonder what I'd be willing to do for the real truth. But that's why I'm here. Because the real truth is what I care about. And so leaving leaving Christianity, I felt like I didn't I didn't have enough answers to be to be able to say, oh well I'm I should be moving on from this life. Like I didn't I didn't feel more worthy, but I didn't feel like, oh, I don't I don't know what's going on. I may as well just leave. No, I didn't I didn't feel that way at all. I was just I was just I just felt all the more lost at the time from what I was our Christianity was making me feel lost through the shit I was going through. Um and then I got out of it. So with so after after leaving Christianity, the option of self-deletion was not in my mind anymore. Meaning the only time I have ever thought self-deletion acceptable for myself in my life was when I was a Christian. After leaving Christianity, granted, I would love to get away from taxes and annoying people who don't understand me or, you know, or, you know, corrupt politicians and, you know, all the shit and problems of the world. I'd love to get away from it all. I'm looking forward <laughs> to not being part of this planet when my time comes. But it's when my time comes now. That's, that's where I'm at with it. That's kind of where I got with my, well, with, with leaving Christianity. I was much more open to staying alive. <laughs> um, and, but like I said, helping, helping other people, specifically people like myself with religious trauma syndrome, that became my main crux. I mean, I didn't, after leaving Christianity, I, my other friend who's still alive, still Christian, wasn't really my reason for staying alive anymore. I had to make up my own. And I chose, you could say, well, I, I chose, but I also, it makes me feel really good to choose to help or to try and help people like myself who have been through relatable, similar shit like I have. No matter how close or far far apart in relation it might be. And and that's all I could think about was just my life sucks. Other people must have been through some similar sucky stuff. Maybe I can help them. Like maybe maybe I can make some use out of my missionary and homeschooled life by showing other people how fucked up the results can be. <laughs> Oh, was well, there was a little bit of that in there, but it was it was it was primarily wanting to help people. Like that's what I really wanted to do because I I hate I hate seeing people suffer. 
And I've been through a lot of suffering myself, and I don't want to see other people suffer like I have. And I know there are other, there are tons of other missionary kids out there. Some who have had great experiences, some homeschoolers who have had great experiences. And a whole lot more that have not, and who don't get any attention, and who have a really hard time making their way through the world, and like me, or like I used to. I'm a lot better at it now. But, as I was saying, this was the only reason that kept me alive for a long time. Up till very recently, it was my primary reason for existing. It's what I, what, what I went with. But the more I worked on myself, the more I've been working towards healing myself, the more I've, the more of these other things that I've learned that I've had to do with these self-affirmations, with working harder to connect with people, with with making that list with just taking the time to self reflect and and really look at myself and my past not just the past I don't like but the other parts the parts where I've been working hard and that I haven't really paid attention and, and, and noticed like just how much effort I've been putting into things. And the thing is, I know you've been doing it too. We all do it. We all ignore the hard work we do because it's easy. It's easy to forget. You get in that rhythm. You get in that, that stage of just grinding, going on and on, week after week, day after day. And it gets mundane to where... You know, even when things aren't going good or bad, they're just kind of like, meh. And you're just going through. Even that can be a little depressing. But, you know, even just even just thinking about how, man, you know, there was a time when I was, I was too stupid to be able to juggle as much stuff as I do now successfully. I mean, I'm able to keep up with my bills. For the most part, I'm able to, you know, go out, go places. I don't always have to, you know, work full time. I get a little bit of time to myself, a little bit of money on the side to treat myself to something special a little now and then. I do make myself work out. I feel good about when it's done, even if it's just a little walk or something. Just things like that, like... If there's some kind of daily maintenance that you've been doing or weekly, monthly, things you've been doing, if you're a full-blown adult and you've been holding your shit together just in finances and 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 life, and your job and everything, if you're doing pretty decently, if you got a roof over your head that you're you're able to do a pretty decent job at keeping there, that's something to be proud of, man. A lot of people don't have that. Especially if you're by yourself. <laughs> I just had to get a roommate. I was able to maintain my shit by myself for a while. Some people can't even do that. It's like, I gotta, I gotta learn to be grateful to myself for what I've been able to do for myself. And that, you know, I have to sit down and think about it to actually do that. And so do you. What have you done lately? You've been taking care of yourself. You've been trying. You've been making some good decisions here and there. Not always, but here and there. And those good decisions are always something to be proud of. Especially when you know you were in the most right place in your heart when you made those decisions. Even if it didn't turn out well, as long as you meant well, as long as you were intending to be honest where it matters, that's something to be proud of. It really is. And you keep on being true to yourself, to that honesty, 
striving for that pure good intention. Just, just be a little bit better of a person you were today than you were yesterday. Just do a little something that makes you proud of yourself. That makes you happy. Don't be afraid to do things that make you happy. Be safe. Be responsible. But do shit that makes you happy. I guess I should have put that on the list. That's the last one. Do shit that makes you happy. I'm going to end the video here because it's already been quite long. But I hope this has helped you. And I look forward to seeing you again in the next video. Until then, my friends, stay safe. And until next time, farewell.